All right, well, welcome this evening to Sherry and Food Pairing with myself, Lauren Denyer, as part of International Sherry Week, obviously the best week of the year. And what I'm going to be doing for this um, webinar is looking at the compounds that we find in the sherries and why it works so well with food. Because there is a science behind all of this. There always is in food and wine pairing. There are generalizations, I know, um, with certain things that you pair, certain foods and wines that you pair together. But we're really going to get delve in. So if you're a little bit geeky, um, you might enjoy this. If you're not so geeky, um, hopefully it won't send you to sleep. Um, but um, you should have a glass, hopefully, of something um, to keep you going anyway, and hopefully something to eat with that too. So um, just a little bit about me before we get started, why I'm so into Sherry. As those of you who I might have taught at the WSET school um, or who've attended any webinars before, um, you know that I'm at Absolutely adore Sherry. I'm pretty obsessed with the stuff. I've been to Jerez a few times. It does help with the obsession, I must say. Um, I really, I mean, I love, I love, I mean, who, everyone here, I'm sure, um, loves food, but I do think Sherry particularly works so, so, so well with it. Um, when I went to Jerez, um, that's when I really, really fell in love with it. And they've got such a great um, food scene there and everything you have all the food you have you have with sherry you don't need to be drinking um, any other kind of spanish wines while you're there so i really got into spain and spanish wines when i was taken across um, the north of spain by master of wine when i did my level three i got a scholarship so and um, that opened my eyes to a lot of spain of course jerez is down in the south but uh, it's just you know having a, having that passion for that country and wanting to know all about different styles of wines there and, and sherry is incredibly in Jerez is an incredibly important part of that. Then in 2017 I was able to go to Jerez and do the sherry educator course so I am a certified sherry educator as well so I got to visit a lot of wineries or bodegas, taste a lot of sherry wines and was exposed to a lot of food pairings there and met some fabulous people who are very influential in the world of sherry. So um, let's get started. I mean, I'm being a little bit geeky about this. Part, as I am um, studying at the moment, I'm currently studying, studying to be a master of wine one day, hopefully. Um, there are some elements of this that actually are quite useful for my studies. Um, so do bear with me if I get too technical. Um, right, so Jerez, here we are. It's incredible. Um, we, this is um, one evening when I was in Jerez. Um, Went to the Debanco El Pasaje, um, and here this is this is how it should be done. This is how sherry should be done. You have a tumbler, okay, um, and then you've got uh, some greaseproof paper in front of you with um, little those those um, little biscuity things, okay. You've got um, lots of different hams, chorizo, um, cheeses. You know that's that's perfect. Okay, that's that's a really lovely way to enjoy sherry. Um, and of course, to have some flamenco there. So this lady who's singing, and this is flamenco singing, okay? So it's not just dancing. I, I put on my earring because I felt inspired flamenco, like, but it isn't just dancing. It's music, it's emotion. And you know, what's more emotive than a glass of Palo Cortado um, with, with some, some chorizo? I mean, it's, it's amazing. The whole pairing was incredible. So here we are down in Jerez, so you can see not far from Cadiz. Um, we've got, um, this is the area, the region here, so I'm going to zoom in on that. And we've got um, the Sherry Triangle here. So we're right on the coast, on the Atlantic coast. Um, we've got a lot of moisture coming from the Atlantic there. Um, this creates ideal situations for aging of the cherries. And it's all about the aging. That's where we get these um, different components, um, compounds in the wines, which is why this is the perfect pairing wine. So um, on my travels, I have been to all of the Sherry Triangle. I've been to Puerto de Santa Maria. Um, and um, went to an incredible restaurant there, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, it was an epic, um, epic pairing meal. Um, Jerez de la Frontera. So Jerez de la Frontera is, is Jerez, where you'll find a lot of the bodegas there. Um, it's the city. And then San Luca de Barrameda, which is on the coast, and that's where Manzanilla um, comes from. So a lot of seafood um, Connotations and associations with our man veneer, which we will see in just a moment. Um, so you can see we've got this amazing landscape. We've got this Alvaretha white soil helps to lock in um, the, uh, the humidity and the water so that we can have um, lovely grapes um, growing during the, the hotter summer. 
And of course, the grapes that grow there are fairly important. So we've got Palomino. So if you're drinking a dry sherry right now, that's 100% Palomino. Okay, um, I will talk about two other grape varieties, Pedro Jimenez and um, Moscatel as well. But most of them, um, of the wines of Jerez are made with the Palomino grape variety. It is quite neutral. Um, although I know that there are people out there championing it for light um, table wines. I say table, I mean um, not a fortified wine. Um, but um, we're, we're going to be um, looking at it um, for, uh, for aging and um, really with the aging that goes on, we don't really need character so much from the grapes themselves. It's more about the maturation process. Okay, so um, I'd like to thank, before I begin actually, um, a few people. Um, not haven't met them all, but uh, they have enabled me to do the research that I needed to do for this um, and in general. And um, there's some good books here and uh, some restaurants that you might be interested in, um, in looking up, although one of them is closed. Um, so Beltran Domecq, the previous president of the Consejo Regulador um, in Jerez, um, who actually was doing a webinar earlier this week, which I watched. Um, he has written a book called Sherry Uncovered. It's about his life, which is incredible, epic. And um, he, because he's part of um, a big, big Sherry background, um, mum and dad. Um, and he, um, he's written this book about his life, about, um, about Sherry, about the science behind Sherry. And there's some recipes in the back there as well. So um, that's, that's really, he really knows his stuff with um, Sherry and food pairing. Um, Francois Chartier, um, a scientist, basically a, a food scientist, um, his book, Taste Buds and Molecules, although it is mind blowing, it's quite difficult to read because he just knows so much. So I was, I've been skimming through that um, over the last few days um, and, uh, and just doing a little bit of reading around the subject. Um, and he's really the one that, that makes sense of why the cherry and, um, and food work so well. But it's not just cherry he talks about, he talks about all different kinds of wines. It's a fascinating book, but it is, it's not an easy read. Fiona Beckett. So Fiona Beckett, um, she is a wonderful um, wine writer and she is also a big fan of Sherry. And you can buy this book online through her, I think, food and wine mapping website. Um, 101 great ways to enjoy Sherry. And so some of the recipes in this book well, not recipes so much, but dishes. Um, I've I've stolen a few and put them in in suggestions because they definitely work. Um, and then Ferran Adria. So Ferran Adria, you may know, is the um, chef at the best restaurant in the world, El Bulli, and um, unfortunately closed now. But he worked very closely with Francois Chartier and um, to put together incredible pairing um, menus. Um, and Francois Chartier also works with um, Joan John and um, Josep Rocca who are the um, chef and sommelier at El Cele de Can Roca as well in Catalonia. So they also really highly prized sherry. You know, this, one, this has also been voted one of the best restaurants in the world, three Michelin stars, of course. Um, and then Angel Leon um, is the chef at Aponiente, which is in Puerto de Santa Maria, which is the restaurant I was referencing before. It's a two Michelin star restaurant where you can get that. It's a tasting menu of about 20 courses with different cherries and absolutely incredible. So all these people really know their stuff and they are championing cherry and uh, they know that it works so, so well with food. So, I mean, there's a simple way of looking at uh, sherry pairing as well. So one of the things they say is if it swims, then drink Fino or Manfanir. And that makes a lot of sense with your Manfanir being in uh, um, San Luca de Barrameda. If it flies, then uh, <laughs> drink Amontillado. Definitely, I've got um, um, some, some recommendations there. And if it walks, uh, <laughs> then drink Oloroso. Um, if you're a vegetarian, maybe you should choose another wine. <laughs> no, I have put in some vegetarian options in this, um, in this webinar as well. I do appreciate that not everyone wants to eat things that are alive. Well, weren't poor well, anyway. So um, we know that in Spain they have this culture of tapas, and tapas was really a way to um, recover your glass um, with a bit of, with a bit of food. And um, you know, if you go to certain cities in Spain, so Granada, for example, you buy a, a drink, you immediately get tapas. There's no no charge for that. You know, it's a big thing. Um, it's, it's it's a big cultural thing. So sherry was a great wine as well to um, have with your tapas. Okay, um, 
Um, it, you can see, right, there's 307, up to 307 molecular compounds found in sherry. That's an awful lot of molecular compounds. That's more than any, any other wine. And for that reason, it means it can go with so many different things. Okay, I mean, you've probably been taught, but if you've done a WSET course, you'll be taught, okay, well, you want um, food with salt and acid are really good for wine, um, you know, and you, maybe you can do this or maybe you shouldn't do that. But actually with sherry, it's just, it's a completely different story. So I will be talking about the um, nuances and, and uh, the intricacies and what works really well with what and we're right here difficult to match flavors there's certain things that wine just doesn't really work with so if you've got fruity wines and you've got umami foods that just doesn't really really work but we've got a really different drink here and uh, we'll see what kind of things work so well jerry also used an ingredient you know put your hand up now i can't see you but if you've popped a bit of sherry into a sauce and it's really lifted it and made it taste wonderful you know and then we'll talk about px pedro jimenez in a moment that's a whole whole different ballpark um there so you know it's it's a great wine it's versatile uh, loads of different foods and also an ingredient as well okay so here's the science part you were looking forward to this i can tell okay so in the world of wine when we're tasting and smelling things we're like oh my goodness it smells of lychees it smells of um of black pepper it smells of green pepper and anyone on looking any onlooker might think what on earth are they talking about this is a it's a wine it's made with grapes maybe it's been in some oak but come on okay but this is a science okay it's this is this has been made through yes grapes but scientific processes and these grapes and this fermentation that's happened and the wine making that's happened and the aging that's happened have all given the wine certain compounds okay so these compounds that you can find in all different kinds of wines they have names and those names they indicate the kind of characteristics and that you're going to find so methoxyphyrazine otherwise known as pyrazine are the kinds of things that you get you get green pepper so if you've had a cabernet sauvignon or a sauvignon blanc you'll know what i'm talking about carmen yeah and that's these are great varieties that have loads of pyrazines okay so sometimes you you know um, if you're studying like i am like oh yes those pyrazines okay or someone else might say oh it smells of green pepper or someone else might say this is sauvignon blanc um then we've got terpenes as well now um terpenes are the, you get quite a few different terpenes so they are um we've got one well one is rotundan rotundan is where you get that black pepper smell so if you've ever had syrup for example particularly syrup from the rhone that can have quite a lot of rotundan in it so it gives you that uh, real black um, black pepper note okay um, and then we've got um, these, so these terpenes are, they're aromatic hydrocarbons, okay, and um, some of them, now so think about it, this is what they're called, some of them, geraniol, okay, remind you of anything, okay, citronellol, okay, so they are, and um, they're linoloids ones, so these are fruity and floral notes that you'll find, um, so in um, for example, Okay, and then we have get organic esters. Now, esters are a kind of acid and they're mostly fruity and you get them in grapes, but you can also get them through yeasts as well. Yeasts can give esters. If you've ever had a wine that smells particularly sort of um, pear-like, pear um, you might find that that's um, ester coming from, from yeast. Okay, things like Pinot Grigio um, tend to uh, use these, these types of yeasts to kind of lift the, those aromas. Okay, um, in oak, we have vanillin, of course, so vanilla. Um, eugenol is um, what smells of clove, so that's what makes your, your oaky wine smell all clovey. Um, and then we've got um, the use of yeasts as well, not only helps provide the esters, um, a lactin is an ester, I'll talk about that in a moment, but also helps to release thiols. Now thiols, um, you get a lot of thiols in Sauvignon Blanc, it's what gives you that passion fruit um, characteristic. And enough thiols is good, too much thiols is bad. Have you ever heard of anyone referring to Sauvignon Blanc as uh, smelling a little bit like cat pee? That's the problem when you have too many thiols. Okay. Um, Lactones I'll talk about a little bit um, later, but you can get some fruity characteristics. You can also get 
talk, which is an interesting one and obviously is going to be very useful when it comes to there potentially being lactones in your wines, your sherry wines. Then, you know, you've probably experienced um, or heard or have heard of malolactic conversion or malolactic fermentation when you change malic acid um, to lactic acid, which will give the texture to the wine, but also um, will give diacetyl to the wine, which is what gives buttery characteristics. So those big buttery chardonnays have gone through malolactic conversion. Um, you've got diacetyl there. And then another acid, acetic acid, um, is an acid, it's a volatile acidity. And that will give you these kinds of polish, uh, sort of nail polish, nail polish remover um, characteristics in wine. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's sulfur notes as well. So if you get something that's particularly flinty um, or metallic, um, that could be from sulfur in small proportions, too much proportions, and you get rotten eggs, which is not very pleasant. So next time you're tasting a wine, you think to yourself, Hmm, okay, what is this? Is this an ester I'm smelling here? Um, or maybe this is a terpene. Um, so there we go. It's all very exciting, I'm sure. So I will translate that into the wine. I'm going to go through each of the styles of sherries in just a moment and have a look at uh, how that works. So just to make sure that we are all on the same page here and have a good understanding of the maturation process of sherry because I think this is quite key. I'm just going to quickly go through the differences and the necessities for biological aging and oxidative aging. So sherry has to be aged in one of those three towns. Um, so we've got San Luca de Barrameda, Puerto de Santa Maria and Jerez de la Frontera. So it has to be aged there. It has to be aged for a minimum of two years. And the wines will be classified and they'll go down two pathways, either oxidatively aging or biologically aging, and then some, a bit of both, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So these barrels are about 600 litres. They're never full. OK, so where they're biologically aging, um, then they're going to grow a layer of yeast called flour. OK, um, F-L-O-R. And um, so this is the yeast here on this picture. And what will happen is the yeast will feed off the nutrients in the sherry. Um, it will breathe the oxygen above. It will release acetaldehyde, which I will talk about in just a moment. Um, and, um, and actually, yes, and it also consumes glycerol as well. Now, it needs certain conditions. It needs to be fortified. It's fortified wine, remember. It's be fortified up to 15%. Okay, so the floor won't survive if it goes beyond 15%. Well, about beyond 15.5%. And it needs certain humidity, which it gets from the Atlantic and the Poniente wind coming from the Atlantic and the Levante wind um, coming from south and the, and the east, which is a hot wind. So... It is the perfect place for floor to be produced. And we're going to find out that floor is so important when it comes to food um, and sherry pairing in just a moment. Now, if we don't want the floor for oxidative aging, so we fortify a bit higher. And then what will happen with oxidative aging is we will have a lot of air which will have in contact with the wine. So that will mean the wines will be much deeper in color. So I've got two wines here. One is biologically aged, so you can see that it is just pale. Um, and it looks like a white wine. And then this one has been oxidatively aged. And of course, the color has changed over time because the molecular compounds change color, the phenol phenols change color. There we go, more science for you. So, um, so I'm gonna go through what biological aging does and what oxidative aging does in with regards to the molecular compounds of these wines and how that translates into food pairings. Okay, so, um, we've got the Solera system, just a quick overview of how it works. So um, when the newly, the newly fortified wine is popped into a Sobre tabler, okay, then eventually um, it will end up in the Solera system. This is a, a fractional blending system. So all cherries, most cherries, pretty much all cherries are non-vintage because they're blend for many years um, and they are all blended together. So you get great consistency um, and they can also age for a very, very long time as well, which gives them such great complexity. So we've got the Solera is the bottom layer of barrels where the oldest wine will be. Okay, above that is the first Criadera, then the second Criadera. We can go all the way up to 14 Criaderas, for example. So that would be a very aged wine then. You take your wine out from the Solera, okay, so it'll all be blended and then bottled, um, and off it goes. And I'll talk about um, serving and storing sherry a little bit later. So when that happens, then you have some wine from the first Criadera, to replenish 
um, and so on and so forth until the youngest wine ends up in the system. Okay, so it's a fractional blending system and it's a really interesting, fascinating traditional system which makes sherry quite unique wine. Okay, so let's look at what floor does. Okay, so you get 36 new aromatic, not, ar not let me say aromatic, not aromantic um, compounds from floor. So already we've got compounds from the wine itself, but then once we have, and also we get some flavours and aromas from the alcohol being added, not very much, um, but then we get this floor. Okay, so we got acetaldehyde. So the floor creates acetaldehyde. So basically it excretes acetaldehyde, and that gives you the bruised apple, nuts, and ham characteristic. So you can see where I'm going here with the ham. Okay, um, there's acetoin as well, which gives creamy, buttery flavours. Um, and these are also found in things like leeks, asparagus, broccoli, and tea, um, so tea leaves. Now, interestingly, asparagus is a rather difficult food to pair with. Um, it's, it's quite umami and savoury. So that's really a key thing happening here with our, with our sherry. Um, we've got lactones, talk about lactones a little bit before. Remember I mentioned that there was pork and also you get pig fruit characteristics in lactones. So we'll come back to that. Um, and we've got our terpenes and the terpenes here are giving us aromas and flavors of basil, coriander, mint, olives, um, saffron and citrus zest. Okay, so all of these things you can find in your Fino and Manfanir wines because Fino and Manfanir are biologically aged. Now, of course, also what is happening is yeast autolysis. So if you know about the production of champagne, for example, um, we have dead yeast cells, which you get through that method as well. And these dead yeast cells, so eventually the, the yeast can't live forever. It grows, so there's more yeast coming, it reproduces, um, but eventually it will die, parts of it will die, and then it falls down into the bottom of the barrel. And these are now leaves, so they're dead yeast cells, and they will, um, they will start to break down. And as they break down, they will give off yeasty notes. Um, a little bit in the case, not, um, not really so much like with, with champagne, but with sherry, you tend to get more like yeast extract, the sort of marmite characteristics. Um, and you might get sort of slightly doughy notes as well. Um, so all sorts of stuff going on. So, you know, you know it's not a simple wine. Manfanir is not a simple wine, okay? When all this is happening and it's had a chance to age for a while under the floor in the Solera system, you know, so many fantastic things are going on. Okay, so here we are. This is what we're looking for. What are we going to eat with your, with your Manfanir? So I'm doing them separately. Manfanir tends to be a lighter style. So Manfanir, um, generally the floor grows thicker. So we're in San Luca de Barrameda. The floor grows thicker. It's got more protection from oxygen and it tends to be a bit lighter and it tends to have more of an iodine sort of seaweed type um, flavour and aroma. So it's very umami. OK, and you can see I've got some umami food pairings here. Um, so here we go. Marcona almonds. Marcona almonds are like the grand cru of almonds. OK, so they're a bit pricey, but they're very, very delicious. So if you've got some of those in front of you. Well done. Very nice. Um, prawns, of course, we're by the sea. And now what I haven't mentioned is the salty characteristic you get on the palate. It's not from salt. It's just a, kind of a dryingness and the acids, the different kind of acids that you get in the wine. So there is no, it's not to do with the, with the sea salt, but it is a characteristic that you pick up um, on the palate. So it works so well with seafood. So I've got prawns, you've got sushi. Sushi is amazing. Sushi, you've got that umami character. You've got that umami character. Sometimes you get kind of a soy note in your finos and your manthanis um, as well. So that works so, so, so well. Olives, as you see, because we had that, that olive note um, when we looked at when it from the slide earlier, which I believe was from the, the terpenes. Um, and then, of course, if you're in San Luca de Barrameda, so those of you that have been there, um, you really must have had a tortilla de camarones, which is uh, these here, these tiny little fried shrimps um, in, a, in a kind of a little pancake. Or a fritter, a fritter. So um, there, there we've got uh, we've got, got some there. So there's a few things, but mostly seafood, as you can see. But you know, San Luca de Barrameda is where it's from, so that's kind of what you would um, what you would expect. So um, I see that I have a few questions. So I'm, uh, oh, there's some stuff in the chat. It may not be questions. It may just be we're having a really nice chat. Um, but um, let's have a look. Um, 
so if anyone does have any questions um i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to smell my pheno um and uh, and see if I can pick up some aromas for the next slide because we've got um, my pheno pairing slide just coming coming on. So um, all good. So we've got some people who went to the um, flamenco bar. Excellent. Um, and we've got okay. The science, the science is all right. And someone's talking about langostina and San Luca de Maramela. Yeah, the pr the prawns there are are fantastic, and that's very typical. Um, they 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 use those. They they rather they eat those um, there. Okay, um, so someone's asked a question about what's the age between the Solera and the first Criantha. It depends. So it depends how often you take the wine out. So it will be different um, for um, it'll be different for different producers. So if you take your wine out more often, then um, you're going to be replenishing it more quickly. So it's going to be younger. Um, but if you take it out um, less often, then uh, it will be a bit older. But with Fino and Manzanilla, it's important that the floor stays alive. So you do need to sort of replenish quite often. So you more frequently take take the wines out than you would for oxidatively aged um, cherries. Okay. Um, right. Um, is there actually umami flavours? Now, umami is a taste. Okay. And um, if you could just turn off your... Um, hang on, I'll do that. Hang on a sec. Good. Um, yeah, so umami is actually a taste rather than a flavour. It was only discovered in the 1900s. Um, so how do we know how long it's been aging? Good question. Um, you kind of have to work it out with a formula. So how often you take the wine out, how many criaderas um, there are. It's a bit, bit of a mathematical formula. Then, you, then it's an, an average age. Okay, um, right. So let's see um, for the next slide, I've got the pheno. So pheno, assuming that it's a little bit weightier, although to be honest, there's not a huge difference. Um, within Pinot Manzanilla. So these are both um, sort of interchangeable, the, the recommendations from these slides. So we've definitely got this acetaldehyde, bruised apple character, salty characteristic, a bit yeasty, and there's some incredible food pairings going out there. So of course, cured ham. So um, here we are. This is me wearing, in my best Lady Gaga impression, um, wearing some Iberico ham um, at the Brindisa Ham School. I have to say, one of the best experiences ever. And um, croquetas, of course. Ham on works very, very nicely. Um, we've also got um, some, some more fish dishes, so some salmon there um, as well. So, um, yes, um, really, really fantastic stuff there. Um, so, yeah, you can see, sorry, I'm just uh, trying to turn off the camera. Um, you can see that we've got, um, yeah, a, a, a bit more weighty foods going on here. And I would say also um, that these foods are probably good suggestions for your pheno or manzanillas. They're on rama. So on rama basically means um, that it has been taken sort of straight out of the cherry butt, okay, the cherry cask with minimal fining and minimal um, minimal filtering, okay. Um, so and, and then we've got passado and passado. So you can have manzanilla passado or fino passado, and they have been slightly oxidised. So they've let the floor die a little bit, um, so that you get a little bit more of an oxidative character. So they're a little bit more like amontillado, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. Um, now you remember the figs. So um, figs wrapped in ham. Okay, dried figs wrapped in ham. This was. Francois Chartier came up with um, with this and uh, it is a winner. I, I did a sherry um, food and pairing uh, event um, a while ago and that was handed out as a, as a little uh, um, amuse-bouche um, with some fino and it went down very, very nicely. Now, I'm listening to a good old Beltran de Mec um, um, earlier this week and he was saying about how vinegary foods go very, very well and there's a reason for this. So this wine here, um, has very, very little acetic acid. So acetic acid um, is the acid, when you have a wine that smells vinegary, really vinegary, there's too much volatile acidity, and that's acetic acid. Now the floor consumes acetic acid, but you don't have um, those characteristics at all in the wine. So that means if you have really vinegary foods, it's not gonna become overwhelming because you're not gonna be pairing it with something that also has those um, elements of those characteristics there as well. 
So um, gildas are these um, anchovy, pickled peppers and olive little pinchos um, that you find um, in Spain. And so they go very, very well. Um, I can't say that I know that they go very, very well personally from experience because I actually don't like vinegar. Um, but uh, for those of you that do, you can try that. Um, now eggs. So eggs are actually quite umami as well. They're quite a difficult pairing. I know some of you might have scrambled eggs with salmon and champagne on Christmas or something, um, but actually eggs work really, really well with pheno and manzanilla. Um, so do bear that in mind, deviled eggs as well. Um, eggs I've talked about. And then for the vegetarians around, um, agadashi tofu. So when I was doing a wine pairing, um, a cherry pairing a while ago, I did this um, as, as an alternative to um, the meat dish and with those umami characteristics the soy um, and the um, and the other elements that were added to it really really worked okay so some very very exciting um, I think um, pairings there okay so yeah I'm gonna have a little sip of my fino make sure you you're having a good sip and, and I'll have a look at and see if you've got any questions while I, while I do that okay mm. I really get that salty, bruised apple, the kind of marmite, soy characteristic coming through, a little bit seaweedy. You now, again, with your manzanilla, you've got that seaweed, you know, so that will be for your, your nori sheets and your, and your sushi. Absolutely brilliant. Um, okay, so um, on, so someone's asking what is on Rama and Posado. So on Rama, straight out of the barrel, okay, um, unfine, unfiltered, or minimally fine, minimally filtered, tends to be a bit richer in texture, very fresh, very tangy, um, Posado, a little bit oxidized, so not quite an Amontillado, but will have a touch, maybe a little bit of nuttiness, okay, yeah, and I love both of those styles, really, really brilliant. Um, Bruno says, heaven is a fig stuffed with blue cheese, wrapped in prosciutto or hamon quickly grilled on barbecue with a fina. Oh, goodness, you're making me so hungry right now. Okay. Um, and do bottles indicate whether biological or oxidative aging? Well, yes, because they'll say fino or manzanilla, which is biological aging. Or they'll say oloroso, which is just oxidative aging. Or they'll say amontillado or palo cortado, which is um, some oxidative aging, some biological aging. So, and if it's a sweet style, like Pedro Jimenez or Moscatel, it will be oxidatively aged. So yeah, basically the style tells you the method of, of maturation. Okay, fantastic. Right, so there's some really lovely biologically aged um, wines there to, um, to pair with some fantastic foods. Um, so now let's have a think about what happens when you go oxidative, okay? So our oxidative aging here, um, slightly different, Okay, um, what we've got um, is an increase in phenols. Okay, um, so phenols you can get from grapes, you can get from oak, um, you get in many, many places, but these are some of the phenols. Okay, so benzoic acid, um, which gives you almond characteristics. Cinnamic acid, okay, well, oh, hang on a minute. Cinnamon, um, coumarin, which gives you vanillin. Vanillin, we've seen that before, and hay. Um, and then we've got a phenolic aldehyde, which gives you all walnut. So you'll find with oxidative, oxidative sherries, they often do have a real walnutty um, quality. Um, so soliton um, is a really interesting lactone. Um, it gives you this kind of curried notes. Again, we've got walnuts, so there we are. Um, maple syrup, okay, um, and soy sauce. Um, now, I heard somewhere that you don't want to have too much soliton in your diet because it can actually make your wee smell of maple syrup, but um, that's, a, that's a whole nother webinar, isn't it? Um, and then we've got sherry lactones, dates, dried figs, um, vanilla, and that volatile acidity um, as well. Um, and this time, you know, instead of being too vinegary, we've got this kind of polish or acetone um, characteristic. Okay, so that's our oxidative aging. And summer wines will have, as they age as well, they lose um, a bit of water. So it concentrates the flavors a lot. Um, with 100% oxidative aging wines as well, um, they have glycerol still. Floor eats glycerol. So in our phenos and mathenias, they're lighter bodied, but in the oxidative aged wines, so 100% oxidative aged wines, these are thicker on the palate as well, which is really interesting, nice sensation, and I think helps with sort of bigger, more powerful foods um, too. Okay, so, oh, I skipped one. Here we are. So, biologically and oxidatively aged sherries. So, I'm talking now primarily about Amontillado, but 
Paolo Cortado is also um, a little bit biologically aged, but not very much. So it tends, we'll probably be thinking more of it um, as a food pairing with the, the next slide with, um, with Oloroso. Um, but if we're, if we're really focusing on Amontillado now, we've got the best of both worlds, okay? We've got the characteristics that you get from underfloor, aging underfloor, and you've got characteristics from op oxidative aging as well. Um, so you've got nuttiness, you've got those walnuts, you've got the little bit of yeastiness, that kind of soy sauce edge, you've got the bruised apple, but you've got fried fig fruit characteristics. Um, you know, you've, you've, got, you've got it all. So here we are. You, there's just so many different things that you can pair. So teriyaki anything, okay? Um, teriyaki tuna is absolutely stunning, actually, twice. This is one that was served um, at an event that I was at, and this is one that I got at the Consejo Regulador. Um, and um, so here I was, I was drinking an Amontillado, so we've got lots of plates of meat there. So we've got the Iberico ham, Iberico pork, different. The ham is, the ham is cured. Um, and then the pork is absolutely delicious as well. It's, it's a pork that you can cook because the pigs are so well looked after um, that you can actually have a steak and it be a bit rare even. Um, so yeah, wonderful. And um, caramelized dishes. So in Beltran de Mex book, um, he had an onion tart recipe and I went with that um, for, um, for a dish that I had with Palo Cortado. Absolutely brilliant because you do get these kind of caramel toffee notes that come through with oxidative aging and that just complemented um, the, um, the, the wine so, so well. And we can get these bigger, more powerful um, meats, so true. So not too spicy though, because I would say these are fortified wines and when we get to Amontillado, we're a minimum of 17% alcohol. You get heat from alcohol and you get heat from spicy food. So together, unless you really want your mouth on fire, I would probably try not to do anything too, too spicy. Um, so the Trizzo or the Sobresada now, if you've had Sobresada, it's basically Spain's answer to Nuja. I don't know if I pronounced that right, although they claim they had it first. Um, so yeah, you can you can use that on your pizza next time. Uh, but yeah, it's like a paste. It's a chorizo paste. It's amazing. Spread it on some, some toast. Um, and then I was hearing about how bacon, sort of glazed bacon works so well. And then we've got this maple syrup and I thought, my goodness, surely you can have amontillado with breakfast. You know, you've got your, your maple syrup, your, your bacon, your pancakes. There we go, um, a beautiful start to the day. Um, artichokes, mushrooms, really difficult, very um, umami as well, particularly mushrooms. So obviously you can cook them with mushrooms with other things, but if you weren't adding a load of salt and cream and other things into the recipe, um, you know, then um, Amontillado works, but it works anyway. Um, it's got these kind of earthy, nutty notes and then mature hard cheeses. So yeah, of course cheese, of course cheese. Um, we'll talk more about cheese. So um, we've got um, some lovely um, ideas there. So, um, every, oh, brilliant. So someone knows what they're having for breakfast on Christmas morning. Okay. Um, and Peter said, with the combination of eggs and pheno, is there any risk that sulfur in the eggs gives you troubles with the pairing? No, the sulfur levels um, are too low. Absolutely too low. It would, that would not be a problem. Okay. Um, someone's saying something about um, fino with mid-ripe cheese seasoned with truffles. Mmm, I'm liking the sound of that. That is brilliant. Okay, so let's have a look now at um, the more sort of 100% more heavily oxidized um, styles here. So we've got these thicker texture now, we've got these roasted notes, you know, it's time to get the big, big food out, like the really powerful stuff, okay? Um, and so here we go. This is something I, I whipped up, or actually my, my sister did, um, but it was part of our event. And we've got these uh, lovely pulled pork, caramelised, a bit caramelised. Um, I think caramelised onions are in there as well. Um, pulled pork um, in brioche buns, of course. Um, and so that worked incredibly well with the, with the Oloroso. Um, thinking back, um, steaks, you know, any old steak, um, so flies and walks, really. Um, we've got, uh, I think this was, I think this was beef, I can't remember, again, a delicious meal that I got um, in the Consejo Regulador, and actually there was a restaurant I went to in Jerez where I got T-bone steak, absolutely amazing. I mean, we think red wine, don't we, with steak, but, you know, try an Oloroso, absolutely stunning. Um, ox cheeks as well, got that real depth of meatiness there, um, the morthia, the black pudding, okay, um, really, really wonderful. Um, sorry, vegetarians, haven't really put much down here for you. Um, 
and we've got dark chocolate and blue cheese. Now, when I talk about Oloroso, I'm talking about dry Oloroso because actually, um, if it says Oloroso on the bottle, by law, um, it should be a dry style, okay? And I know there are some that say Oloroso Dolce or might say sweet there, but if it's a sweetened Oloroso, it should really be called a cream cherry. Um, and we'll talk about those cherries in a moment, not to be forgotten. So we've got lots of really intense um, flavours here. So think that kind of, again, the caramelised, roasted, there's nuttiness, there's so much nuttiness. And of course, cheese, a lot of power here. So blue cheese um, is a really good pairing with, um, with Oloroso. Okay, so um, let's have a look at the sweet stars. Now I've got a whole different slide dedicated to Pedro Jimenez. Okay, so I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Um, but there's such um, a range of sweet stars of sherry. So some aren't so sweet, some are really sweet. Okay, um, and the great thing about sweet wines is that you should never assume that you can only eat them with, you can only eat sweet things with them. Because of course, you've got this sweet, savoury combination going on, which can be wonderful. And uh, so you should have a think, think about that when pairing sweet wines with savoury foods. So here are some, um, some suggestions. Cheese, of course. Sweet wine and cheese. So I like that as a dessert alternative. You know, I do have a bit of a sweet tooth, but if I'm at the end of a meal and I just don't think I can handle pudding, um, then I might think, you know what, I'll have a, a glass of something, maybe nibble, nibble on some cheese. Um, and that always works very, very nicely. So hard cheeses, blue cheeses. I would say for me, one of the better pairings um, I've had with cheese is a, um, a, a good cream sherry. So um, this one here is um, almost a cream sherry really. It's a, it's a sweetened um, palo cortado. Um, so it's a medium or, but it's more oxidative. So medium slash um, cream sherry here. And um, that works really, really well with, um, uh, with, with cheese. So just to be a bit clear about what these are. So you've got blended cherries. Now blended cherries are palomino cherries, so they were based on a dry sherry, and then you add a sweetening component. So that sweetening component is usually Pedro Jimenez, the sherry Pedro Jimenez, because the sherry Pedro Jimenez is so sweet, you just you add it like you might add sugar to sweeten something. So that's that's how you make a blended cherry. So you have um, you've got your cream cherry, which is based on an oxidative um, cherry, so basically an oloroso that's sweetened with Pedro Jimenez. Um, or you've got Amontillado, which is a medium cherry, so um, Amontillado blended with some Pedro Jimenez. Um, and then um, you've got pale cream, and pale cream is pale. It's a biologically aged sherry, and they usually add rectified concentrated grape must um, so that it stays pale. So um, those, those are your wines. And there is, uh, there is a pairing for, um, for pale um, cream sherry, and that is sweet and salty popcorn. Thank you, Fiona Beckett, for that. Because honestly, I was struggling with what you might pair um, with pale cream sherry. I really was. Um, but look at all the things you can you can share. So um, you can pair with it. So cheese, of course, foie gras. Um, if that's not your thing, I know it isn't everyone's thing. Um, there is actually an ethical producer of foie gras um, in Spain. So maybe um, look that up. Um, now this is um, a little sort of marmalade orange cake that I made for um, our dairy event. And that, I have to say, goes very well. And anything sort of with that kind of orange citrus um, quality goes really, really well with Muscatel sherry. So Muscatel sherry is made with the Muscat grape variety. It's dried out, the grapes are dried out, um, and then they make a wine with it. And the sugar is so concentrated that you can't, um, it can't ferment the dryness. So it's always a sweet sherry, but it's also fortified really early on during the um, fermentation. Um, so yeah, so this is this is a, a type of cherry that is actually fermentation is interrupted and it's fortified, and then so you get a very very sweet style. But it has a um, muscat is a very aromatic grape variety. It's one of those ones that's got lots of terpenes, um, so you get um, the, a lot of fruity characteristics, and you still get them even after extended aging. And I particularly pick up orange peel in these wines, which I, I thought is quite nice to have it with a with an orangey style cake there. Um, of course, chocolate, um, you know, you've got these almost chocolatey notes, caramel characteristics coming through with oxidative aging wines. So that is a no brainer really. And then remember we had that cinnamon, um, a cinnamon acid 
So anything cinnamon based is going to work really, really well with an, um, something like an Oloroso, a sweetened Oloroso, so your, your cream cherry. And, you know, cream cherries aren't just Harvey's Bristol cream. You can, lots of producers make fantastic ones. So here we go, we've got Lufstyle, East India, Solera um, here too. And, you know, anything, you know, lovely sweet desserts, but also um, savoury stuff. And of course, the season soon for our mince pie or two um so with all of those fruity um and particularly those kind of raisiny fruitcake notes which work so well with wines that have had some pedro jimenez added because pedro jimenez is a great variety which is also when they make cherry with it is also raisin they raisin the grapes very very much um and let's talk about that now um so here we go it's virtually black isn't it look at the color of it amazing okay and of course there's a few dishes here so you can get huge amounts of sugar in these wines. They are very, very luscious, okay? And it is a dessert, really, um, just by itself. Okay, you can get about up to 400 or so grams a litre of sugar in these wines. Like, that's craziness. I think it's about it 60 in a can of Coke. So there we go. You need a good dentist um, if you're going to drink a lot of that. Um, so... I'm just going to um, give you a few ideas here. So cheese, of course, and I think we already had someone who was, who was doing that, bit of cheese there, um, and stuff the cheese very well. And if you think about it, you know, you like it, mate, you eat some raisins with, the, um, with, with your cheese. Um, foie gras, okay, got that sweet and savoury thing going on again. I'm a bit of a fan of foie gras, sorry. Um, um, but also can be used as a glaze, of course. Ice cream, you know, that's what Pedro Jimenez is famous for, having pouring it on ice cream. Okay, so um, drink it with ice cream, pour it on ice cream. Um, and then churros, of course, the Spanish churros, which you, you could dip it in, couldn't you, instead of chocolate. Um, so um, lo lots, of, lots of lovely um, pairing um, um, combinations there. And uh, this, is, this is something I created. I'm so proud of this creation. I got a mold and I poured chocolate into it and made a chocolate cup with Pedro Jimenez in it. Can you, can you even imagine? Like, that was just so ridiculously sweet. Um, so... Um, let's see what else. Um, what else you, you've been um, asking or, or saying? Um, so we've got ah, someone's got a sweet Pedro Jimenez Montilla Morales. Yes, so Montilla Morales is a bit different. Um, it's it's um, further um, east from um, Jerez, and they make their sherry star wines, but all with Pedro Jimenez. Um, so they can actually make the dry styles as well, and they're not necessarily fortified. Um, so um, it, it will either be fortified or not fortified. Um, and if it's 1990, then yes, it would be a vintage. And so, yes, they wouldn't have used the Solera system for that. So there's some good points there. Thank you. Um, so Fina Amontillado, Manzanilla, they're only dry. They should only be dry. That's the legal requirement, really. But there are some peaky things people put on labels. Um, so actually, now this is a medium sherry. And I remember now, because when I had this before, <laughs> this is great. They don't say anywhere on it that it's, that it's not, it doesn't say explicitly that it's Palo Cortado. Um, but it does say, um, Elaborado con Palo Cortado. EPX, so made with Palo Cortado and Pedro Jimenez this is on the back. And then in really tiny, tiny, tiny writing, it says medium. Okay, so um, yeah, they're not, <laughs> you, can, you can imagine, you're Spanish, you've been making sherry for years, and you've been told you've got to write an English word on them, I mean, what's that all about? Um, right, good question, um, Foma, how long does sherry last once it's open? I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. I'm going to do a bit of serving and storage, um, because it is a really interesting wine um, in terms of how long you can kind of keep it for and when you should open it, when you, what you should do with it after you've opened it. Um, and then Tori's saying, when you did your level three, the impression that the cream sherries are a very unfashionable British thing, which is almost an embarrassment to the sherry industry. Is that fair? Well, um, let's put it this way. There are sherries um, that are not as good quality, that have been very popular. Um, there was, oh, I can't remember the name of the producer now, but a big, big producer um, who started making a lot of not such great sherry um, and they were giving that to a big sherry and they, they were supplying a big sherry producer, one of which was a sweetened sherry. Um, and so they aren't really um, the best examples of sherries. Um, but, um, and it was really a certain market who, um, who liked those kinds of sherries and they wouldn't be seen as a food pairing thing. Um, 
it's a very different culture. The culture we have in the UK around sherry has been based on sweet cherries, sweetened cherries, blended cherries, but the culture in Jerez is all really about dry cherries um, mostly. But actually, you know, the fact that these sweetened cherries are made, there are some really, really fantastic examples. Um, okay, can you download this um, PowerPoint? I will uh, make, I can make it available to you. I'll sort something out. Um, Okay, so Pedro Jimenez and sticky toffee pudding. Yep, yep, good shout there. Um, how about Pedro PX San Emilio? I don't know that one. Um, you'll have to tell me all about that. Um, any particular type of cheese? Um, something quite powerful. I wouldn't really go with um, with like younger cheeses, sort of bigger, more, more nutty cheeses. And again, you know, if we think about other famous pairings with cheese, sort of port and Stilton, you know, that kind of blue cheeses again, um, really good. How would you pair the non-fortified Palomino Fino wines? Um, they're very light and delicate, actually, those wines tend to be. So you probably wouldn't want to have them at anything too characterful because um, they would overpower it. Um, so probably sort of light salad, seafood. Um, I would think. Um, at what point did the producer decide to make a wine as a Fino and an Oloroso or Amontillado? To make a single batch of wine and then decide was it just in from the vineyard selection? Really good question, Lynn. Um, what they do is they, um, they actually, when they press the grapes, the first lot that come off the press, which is the lighter, more delicate um, juices, they become the Finos and Manthaneers. And then if it's heavier with more phenolics in it, um, that will become an Oloroso. Um, and then they, re they, then they reclassify again um, after they've made the wine, the base wine, before fermentation to see, before fortification, to see how, how it's worked out, if it still seems like a Fino or if it still seems like an Oloroso. Then they reclassify after they've fortified um, to see if the floor has developed well on the Fino, then it will stay a Fino or a Manzanir. Um, if it doesn't, then um, it, it will may well become a Palo Cortado. Um, so you can actually be the same vineyard, same grapes, but make all the different styles of Palomino wines. Um, okay, so all oh, we've got a suggestion of fortified wines with stills and other blues. Yep, okay. Um, and is sherry ever made without the Solera system? I single barrel. There are some vintage sherries, um, but they are pretty rare. Um, so the answer is yes, but not very much. Um, Okay. Oh, sorry. The Lister PX San Emilio. I don't think I've had that. I've had a few PXs, but not that one. I, I don't think. Um, are there categories or style names for sweet cherries? So just these, these blended cherries. So it's either cream, um, medium, pale cream, or the name of the grape. So if it's got PX written on it, Ped or Pedro Jimenez written on it, it's 100% Pedro Jimenez um, or Muscatel. Um, and then we've got a question. Is Palo Cortado um, always something that develops accidentally or can it be made intentionally as such? Is it then able to be sweetened that it's neither an Amontillado nor an Oloroso? So Martha, um, yes, it can be made accidentally, but I suspect often it isn't because we're in a bodega, we've got a certain amount of wine to produce. I don't think you can let things happen too accidentally. Um, so I do suspect there is a, um, a strategy, um, but what I will say, it's generally more oxidative than it is biological. So it tends to resemble more an Oloroso and they don't make so much of it. So it's a bit rarer, tends to be a bit more expensive. This is a sweetened Palo Cortado, so it's a medium sherry. Okay, um, then we've got, are the vintage sherries rare? Because difficult to make or because not really that great. You know, I'm not sure. Um, I just think that maybe, I don't think, I think I've tasted one once. I can't say that I remember it being particularly great or particularly not great. Um, I think it's just to have a different style in, in the portfolio. Um, but really for me, Sherry's about the Solera system. So I can't really answer that question very well, sorry. Um, Sandra, is Palomino called something different in France or Italy? N I know it's called Listan Blanco in Tenerife, um, but I don't know that it's grown um, in, um, in France or Italy, actually. Um, I'm, I'm liking that your, your PX1990 is fantastic. I think Pedro Jimenez probably does work better as a wine that, um, that can't, doesn't need a Solera system um, so much. Um, but um, I'm good to, good to know. Um, on Rama are usually vintage. On Rama just means straight from the um, barrel. So I don't know that it is usually vintage, um, but I will, I'll, I'll look up. 
And so it's called Listan in France as well, is it? As well as in them um, in Tenerife. Excellent. Okay. Now, Sylvina's asking me about VOS and VORS. Good question. So VOS. So um, as we know, this is a non-vintage product. Then we know that um, um, we are getting an average age. So you will see average age indications on the wines, um, on some of them. Um, so the minimum of the the statement, the age statement that I have on the wine, the lowest is twelve years. Then it's fifteen years. And then 20 years, well, 20 years is called a VOS, a very old sherry or vinum optimum signatum. Um, and then VORS is 30 years, very old rare sherry, vinum optimum rare signatum. So those are the VOS and VORS categories, but they can only apply to oxidative styles. So they will only apply to um, Amontillado, Palo Cortado, Oloroso, Pedro Jimenez and Noscatel. Okay, um, and the blended um, styles as well. So this one here, this is a 30 year old. So this is a, can you see, it's got Vinum Optimum Rare Signatum on it. Um, you don't, with the Finos and Mampaneers, you can't get Vinum Optimum Signatum wines or 12 years age because the floor will die if um, the Solera system is too vast, if you've got too many Criaderas. Okay, um, so, Getting close to the end now. Oh, I didn't expect that, even though I created this. So here we've got, this is from the, um, the Vinos de Jerez, the um, um, part of the regular, the Consejo Regular Door. So they've got a few little, uh, a little mapped out um, pairing for you there. Um, I would just, I have, I have issue with the hot spicy one here, <laughs> but everything else, um, it's just a little, a little summary um, for you. And, um, this will be, this is being recorded, it will be on YouTube, so you can see it again, and I can also make this available. If you want to email me for it, um, I'll give you my email address at the end. So, very important now, serving sherry, storing sherry, etc. The sherry should always be chilled, okay? So when your grand takes their sherry off of the, um, off the sideboard, um, when it's been sitting there for ages and offered you a glass, you could be like, why isn't it in the fridge? Um, so really, um, that's, that's where it should be. And when you get your, when you buy your sherry, you'll notice probably um, that it's got a stopper, okay? Now a stopper in a fortified wine means ready to drink. Do not keep me, okay? So, um, particularly with the biologically aged wine, so your Fino and your Manzanilla, and definitely your Unrama, okay? They should be drunk as soon as they're bought. Don't keep them in a cupboard because over time, um, they will start to oxidize. So they oxidize and that changes their, how they should be. Um, because we know that they've always been protected by floor. So they don't, we don't want to um, give them any, um, any exposure to oxygen. Also, on Rama, it's fresh, it's tangy, it's come straight from the barrel and it should be consumed very, very soon. If you keep it on Rama for more than six months, it's not gonna be as good as it should. So you should drink those straight away. The oxidative styles will last a bit longer, but there's no point keeping them. They're already developed. They've already got all the characteristics they're ever gonna have. So, you know, you just need to drink them. Don't keep them. Now, when you serve your cherries, you should be serving them, the, um, the, the phenos and your manthaneers, between five and seven degrees Celsius, okay? Um, so similar as you would to um, most white wines, really. Um, the oxidized styles, they suit being a little bit warmer, so 12 to 14 degrees. And then your pale cream, so your Croft Original, uh, if you like, um, is can be a little bit warmer than your Fino and Manthanier. So those, those are the recommended from, from the Consejo Regulador, but I have to say, I agree. I think that it should be chilled always. Once you've opened your sherry, um, it is, I would use a vacuum van, okay? Um, and with your Finos and Manthaneers, um, they should be drunk as a white wine should within a couple of days, okay? Um, with your Amontillado, Palo Cusado, and Oloroso, you can keep them for longer, but I would say the more oxidized they are, the longer you can keep them open, but still, I would say within a couple of weeks, um, really. Okay, um, so yeah, so that's, that's the, the key thing, and you know, I would always keep all of them in, in the fridge um, after opening them because it slows down the reactions um, to oxygen, the chemical reactions, and we'll keep them a bit fresher. But 
you know, use use your pump. Um, don't worry about the Coravan. I mean, what these sherry wines are, are not expensive. So, um, and I don't think you can even do that really because they've got stoppers. Um, but yeah, so these. Um, but yeah, make sure you do have it in the right conditions. Now, you might have noticed that I'm drinking mine out of a normal wine glass. That's kind of what they do in Jerez. So you know, they kind of not, they don't know what they're doing. So I will. Uh, I'll copy them. Thank you. Of course, um, you can see these glasses, a bit like the glasses we use at the school, and these are ISO glasses, and they also work really well. At the end of the day, um, I am using a wine glass, but I'm never going to pour that much in there because it's a 45 wine. I only, only put, put a little bit, and because these are smaller glasses, um, really, um, that's, that's why they are often used. And, and then if you're in the Tabanco El Paraje, they give it to you in a tumbler. So um, there we go. Right, so um, I think I think that's um, pretty much everything I was going to say. I'll see what other questions you have. Um, I'm glad, Leah, that you like the cherry rainbow. I, 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 love, I do love a cherry rainbow. Um, and yeah, so if you've got any questions, there we go. There I am doing a really, really poor attempt with the Venencia, which is what you use to get the um, cherry out of the, out of the barrel there, the, the cherry butt. Um, so let's see what we asked. Um, what we said, um, I know, Paul, I want to drink all the cherries as well. Um, and oh my goodness, someone's given us a whole list of what Palomino is called. Thank you very much for trying to screenshot that. Um, okay, I have no idea about Golden Sassalas. <laughs> so um, you might have to, have to Google that one. Um, I will make sure that I share the presentation. So if you email me at ldenya, I'll put it in the chat now. ldenya at WSET Global dot com um, and um, I'll make sure that's available for you um, and if anyone's got any other questions um, do let me know um, if this will be recorded so if you want to see it again it will be recorded if you just go on to YouTube and type in WSET School London we have loads of recordings that we've done over the um, over the past few months so it will be up there probably tomorrow or the next day so um, yeah, um, thank you all for coming and giving up your time and, and enjoying um, Sherry with me. Um, if you want to use any, look on our, any of our WSCT school um, social media, here we are. I've also got uh, Twitter, I think I'm Wine Lauren or and Lauren Denny on Instagram if you want to do any, any of that. Yes. Um, but yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're going to go get infused and start doing some cooking. And um, thank you for your, your great questions and um, your participation. I'm going to stop the recording now and if anyone wants to turn on their mics or ask um, any questions, um, you can do in just a sec.